So I guess I'll do an open quote here and read the book. And when I'm done, close, close the quote. And maybe give you some thoughts on what I think about it. So. You ready, folks? Okay. The subtle art of... The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. Chapter 1. Don't try. Maybe I'll read it like this. Don't try. Let's get you up moved over here. Don't try. Okay. Charles Bukowski was an alcoholic organizer. A chronic gambler, a lout, a cheap steak, a deadbeat, and on his worst days, a poet. He's probably the last person on earth you would ever look for, uh, look to for life advice, or expect, or expect to, to see in any sort of self-help book. Which is why he's perfect the place. Which is why he's the perfect place to start. I'm on a roll here, reading a Bukowski. Wanted to be a writer. But for decades, his work was rejected by almost every magazine, newspaper, journal, agent, and publisher he submitted to. His work was horrible, he said. Crude, disgusting, depraved. And as the stacks of rejection slips piled up, the weight of his failures pushed him deeper into an alcohol-fueled depression that would follow him for the most of his life. Dang. Bukowski had a day job as a letter filer at a post office. He got paid shit money and spent most of his most of it on booze. He gambled away the rest at the racetrack. At night he would drink alone and sometimes hammer out poetry on his beat up old typewriter. Often he'd wake up on the floor, having passed out the night before. Thirty years went by like this. Most of it a meaningless blur of alcohol, drugs, gambling, and prostitutes. Then when Bukowski was 50, after a lifetime of failure and self-loathing, an editor at a small independent publishing house took a strange interest in him. The editor couldn't offer Bukowski much money or promise of sales, but he had a weird affection for the drunk loser, so he decided to take a chance on him. It was the first real shot Bukowski had ever gotten, and he realized probably the only one he would ever get. Bukowski wrote back to the editor, I have one of two choices. Stay in the post office and go crazy, or stay out here and play at writer and starve. I've decided to starve. Upon signing the contract, Bukowski wrote his first novel in three weeks. It was called simply Post Office. Dedication, he wrote, dedicated to nobody. <laughs> Bukowski would make it as a novelist and poet. He would go on and publish six novels and hundreds of poems, selling over two million copies of his book. His popularity defied everyone's expectations, particularly his own. Stories like Bukowski's are the bread and butter of our cultural narrative. Bukowski's life embodies the American dream. A man fights for what he wants, never gives up, and eventually achieves his wildest dreams. It's particularly a movie waiting to happen. We all look at stories like Bukowski's and say, See, he never gave up. He never stopped trying. He always believed in himself. He persisted against all the odds and made something of himself. It is then strange that on Bukowski's tombstone, the epitaph reads, Don't try. Hmm. See, despite the book sales and the fame, Bukowski was a loser. He knew it. And his success stemmed not from some determination to be a winner, but from the fact that he knew he was a loser, accepted it, and then wrote honestly about it. He never tried to be anything other than what he was. The genius of Bukowski's work was not an overcoming of into a shining literary, literary light. It was the opposite. It was his simple ability to be completely unflinchingly, unflinchingly, sorry, honest with himself, especially the worst parts of himself, and to share his failings with her without hesitation or doubt. Sounds like me. <laughs> this 
is the real story of Bukowski's success. His comfort with himself as a failure. Bukowski didn't give an F word about success. <laughs> Even after his fame, he still showed up to poetry readings, hammered and verbally abused people in his audience. He still exposed himself in public and tried to sleep with every woman he could find. Fame and success didn't make him a better person, nor was it by becoming a better person that he became famous and, su and successful. <laughs> Almost said unsuccessful, sorry. Self-improvement and success often occur together, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the same thing. Our culture today is obsessively focused on re unrealistically positive expectations. Be happier, be healthier, be the best, be better than the rest, be smarter, faster, richer, sexier, more popular, more productive, more envied, and more admired. Be perfect and amazing and crap out 12 karate. Oh, karate. 12 karat gold nuggets before breakfast each morning while kissing your selfie ready spouse and two and a half kids goodbye. Then fly your helicopter to your wonderfully fulfilling job where you'd spend your days going incredibly meaningfully, or where you spend your days doing incredibly meaningful work that's likely to save the planet one day. Huh, yeah. <laughs> but when you stop and really think about it, conventional life advice, all the positive and happy self help stuff we hear all the time is actually fixating on what you lack it lasers in what you perceive your personal shortcomings and failures to already be and then emphasizes them for you you learn about the best ways to make money because you feel like you don't have enough money already you stand in front of the mirror and repeat affirmations saying that you're beautiful because you feel as though you're not beautiful already you follow dating and relationship advice because you feel that you're unlovable already you try goofy visualization exercises about being more successful because you feel as though you aren't successful enough already. Ironically, this fixation on the positive, on what's better, what's superior, only serves to remind us over and over again of what we are not and what we lack, of what we should have been but failed to be. After all, no truly happy person feels the need to stand in front of a mirror and recite that she's happy. She just is. Just saying in Texas, the smallest dog barks the loudest. A confident man doesn't feel a need to prove that he's confident. A rich woman doesn't feel a need to convince anybody that she's rich. Either you are or you're not. And if you're dreaming of something that all that time, then you're reinforcing the same unconscious reality over and over that you are not that. Everyone in their TV commercials wants you to believe that the key to good life is a nicer job or a more rugged car or a prettier girlfriend or a hot tub with inflatable pool for the kids. The world is constantly telling you that you are to, that the path to a better life is more, 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 buy more, own more, make more, fuck more, be more. You've constantly bombarded with messages to give a fuck about everything all the time. Give a fuck about a new TV. Give a fuck about having a better vacation that your coworkers. Give a fuck about buying that new lawn ornament. Give a fuck about having the right kind of selfie stick. Why? My guess? Because giving a fuck about more stuff is good for business. <laughs> and while there's nothing wrong with good business, the problem is that you give too many fucks is bad for your mental health. It causes you to become more overly attached to superficial fake to dedicate your life to chasing a mirage of happiness and satisfaction. The key to a good life is not giving a fuck about more. It's giving a fuck about less. Giving a fuck about only what is true and immediate and important. That's so amazing. Literally, this author sounds like me. <laughs> Outstanding. Great work. Mark, this is, this is great so far. You got me hooked. The feedback loop from hell. There's an insidious quirk to your brain that, if you let it in, can drive you absolutely batty. Tell me if this sounds familiar to you. Let me know in the comment sections if it sounds familiar to you, okay? You get anxious about confronting somebody in your life. That anxiety cripples you and you start wondering why you're so anxious. Now you're becoming more anxious about being anxious. Oh no, doubly anxious. Now you're anxious about your anxiety, which is causing more anxiety. Quick, where's the whiskey? Or let's say you have an anger problem. You get pissed off at the stupidest, most insane thing. And you have no idea why. And 
fact that you get pissed off so easily starts to piss you off even more. Then in your petty rage, you realize that being angry all the time makes you a shallow and meaning and a mean person. And you hate this. You hate it so much that you get angry at yourself. Hey, look at you. You're angry at yourself for getting angry about being angry. Fuck you, wall. Here, have a fist. <laughs> that sounds like me. <laughs> or you're so worried about doing the right thing all the time that you become worried about how much you're worrying. Or you feel so guilty for every mistake and you make that. You begin to feel guilty about how guilty you're feeling. Wow, sad and lonely so often that it makes you feel even more sad and alone just thinking about it. Welcome to the feedback loop from hell. Chances are you've engaged in more than a few times than you think. Maybe you're engaging in it right now. God, I do the feedback loop all the time. I'm such a loser for doing it. I should stop. Oh my God, I feel like such a loser for calling myself a loser. I should stop calling myself a loser. Ah, fuck. <laughs> I'm doing it again. See, I'm a loser. Arr. Calm down, amigo. Believe it or not, this is the part of the beauty of a hum of being a human. Very few animals on Earth have the ability to think the cognitive thoughts to begin with. But we humans have the luxury of being able to th about to have thoughts about our own thoughts. So I think I can think about watching Miley Cyrus videos on YouTube and then immediately think about what a sicko I am for wanting to watch Miley Cyrus videos on YouTube. Ah, the miracle of consciousness. But there's a problem. Our society today through wonders of consumer culture and hey look my life is cooler than your social media has bred a whole generation of people who believe that then having these negative experiences anxiety fear guilt etc is totally not okay i mean if you look at your facebook feed everybody there is having a fucking grand old time look eight people got married this week and some 16 year old on tv got a ferrari for her birthday and another kid just made two billion dollars inventing an app that automatically delivers more you more toilet paper to you when you run out meanwhile you're stuck at home flossing your cat and you can't help but think your life sucks even more than you thought the feedback loop from hell has become a borderline epidemic making many of us overly stressed overly neurotic and overly self-loathing back in grandpa's day <laughs> he would feel like shit and think to himself gee whiz i sure do feel like a cow turd today <laughs> but hey i guess that's just life back to shoveling hay <laughs> but now now you feel like shit for even five minutes you're bombarded with 350 images of people totally happy and having fucking amazing lives and it's impossible to not feel like there's something wrong with you. It's this last part that gets us into the trouble. We feel bad about feeling bad. We feel guilty for feeling guilty. We get angry about feeling get angry. We get anxious about feeling anxious. What is wrong with me? This is why not giving a fuck is so key. This is why it's going to save the world. And it's going to save it by accepting that the world is totally fucked. And that's alright because it's always been that way and it always will be. By not giving a fuck that you feel bad, you short circuit the feedback loop from hell. Just say to yourself, I feel like shit, but who gives a fuck? And then if it's sprinkled by magic, fuck giving fairy dust, you stop hating yourself for feeling so bad. George Orwell said that to see what's in front of one's nose requires a constant struggle. Well, the solution to our stress and anxiety is right there in front of our noses. And we're too busy watching porn and advertisements for ab machines that don't work, wondering why we're not banging a hot blonde with a rocking six-pack to notice. We joke about um we joke about this online with first world problems, but we really have become victims of our own success. Stress related health issues, anxiety disorders, and cases of depression have skyrocketed over the past thirty years, despite the fact that everyone has a flat screen TV and can have our groceries delivered. Our crisis is no longer material; it's existential. It's spiritual. We have so much fucking stuff and so many opportunities. We just don't even know what the fuck, what what to give a fuck about anymore. Because there's an infinite amount of things we now know, or so we can now see or know. There are so many, ins there is also infinite number of ways we can discover that we don't measure up, that we're not good enough, that things aren't as great as they could be, and this rips us apart inside. Because here's the thing, what's wrong with all that how to be happy shit has been shared 8 million times on Facebook in the past few years. Here's what nobody realizes about all this crap. The desire for more positive experience in itself is a negative experience. And paradoxically, paradoxically, the acceptance of one's negative experience is itself a positive experience. This is a total mindfuck. So I'll give you a minute to unpretzel your brain and maybe read that again. 
wanting positive experience is a negative experience. Accepting negative experience is a positive experience. It's what the philosopher. It's what the philosopher Alan Watts used to refer to as the backyards or the backwards law. Backwards law. <laughs> the idea that more you pursue feeling better all the time, the less satisfied you become as pursuing something only reinforces the la- the fact that you lack it in the first place. The more you desperately want to be rich, the more poor and more unworthy you feel, regardless of how much money you actually make. The more you desperately want to be sexy and desired, the uglier you come to yourself, regardless of your actual physical appearance. The more you desperately want to be happy and loved, the lonelier and more afraid you become, regardless of those around you. The more you want to be spiritually enlightened, the more self-centered and shallow you become in trying to get there. It's like this one time I tripped on acid and it felt like the more I walked towards a house, the further away the house got from me. And yes, I just used my LSD hallucinations to make a philosophical point about happiness. No fucks given. As the existential philosopher Albert Camus said, and I'm pretty sure he wasn't on LSD at this time, you will never be happy if you continue to search for what happiness consists of. You will never live if you are looking for the meaning of life. Or put more simply, don't try. <laughs> Now I know what you're saying. Mark, this is ma- making my nipples all hard. But what about the Cam- Camaro I've been wanting to save up for? What about the beach body I've, nev- I've been starving myself for? After all, I paid a lot of money for that app machine. What about the big house in the lake I've been, war- I've been dreaming of? If I stop giving a fuck about those things, well, then I'll never achieve anything. I don't want that to happen, do I? I'm so glad you asked. Ever notice that sometimes when you care less about something, you do better at it? Notice how it's often the person who the who is the least invested in the success of something that actually ends up being able to achieve it. Notice how sometimes when you stop giving a fuck, everything seems to fall into place. What's with that? What's interesting about the backwards law is that it's called backwards for a reason. Not giving a fuck works in reverse. Pursuing the positive is a negative, and pursuing the negative generates a positive. The pain you pursue in the gym results in better all around health and energy. The failures in business are what led to a better understanding of what's necessary to be successful. Being open with your insecurities paradoxically, paradoxically makes you more confident and charismatic around others. The pain of honest confrontation is, the gener- is what generates the greatest trust and respect in your relationships. Suffering through your fears and anxieties is what allows you to build courage and preser- pres- perseverance. Sorry. Seriously, I could keep going, but you get the point. Everything worthwhile in life is won through sum- surmounting the associated negative experience. Any attempt to escape the negative to avoid it or quash it and silence silence it only backfires the avoidance of suffering is a form of suffering the avoidance of struggle is a struggle the denial of failure is a failure hiding what is shameful is itself a form of shame pain is an ex oh my gosh inextricable thread in the fabric of life and to tear it out is not impossible not only impossible but destructive Attempting to tear it out unravels everything else from it. Or with it, sorry. To try to avoid pain is to give too many fucks about pain. In contrast, if you're not able to give a fuck about the pain, you become unstoppable. In my life, I've given a fuck about many things. I've also not given a fuck about many things. And like the road not taken... It was the fucks not given that made it all the difference. Chances are you know somebody in your life who, at one time or another, did not give a fuck and then went on to accomplish amazing feats. Perhaps there was a time in your own life where you simply did not give a fuck and excelled in an extraordinary height. For myself, quitting my day job in finance only after six weeks to start an internet business ranks pretty high up in my and there in my own didn't give a fuck hall hall of fame. Same with deciding to sell most of my possessions and move to South America. Fuck's given? None. Just went and did it. 
these moments of non-fuckery are the monuments that define most of our lives. The major, the major switch in careers, the spontaneous choice to drop out of college and join a rock band, the decision to finally dump that deadbeat boyfriend whom you've caught wearing your pantyhose a few too many times. Now give a fuck is a stare down life's most terrifying and difficult challenges and still take action. While not giving a fuck may seem simple on the surface, it's a whole new bag of burritos under the hood. I don't even know what that sentence means, but I don't give a fuck. <laughs> a bag of burritos sounds awesome. Let's just go with it. Most of us struggle throughout our lives by giving too many fucks in situations where fucks do not deserve to be given. We give too many fucks about the rude gas station attendant who gave us a ch our charge, our change in nickels. We give too many fucks about the show that we liked as that was canceled on TV. We give too many fucks when our coworkers don't bother asking us about how our how our weekend was so awesome. Meanwhile, our credit cards are maxed out, our dog hate us, hates us, and Junior is snorting meth in the bathroom, yet we're getting pissed off about nickels and everybody loves Raymond. Look, this is how it works. You're going to die one day, and I know that's kind of obvious, but I just want to remind you in case you've forgotten, you and everyone you know are going to be dead soon. In the short amount of time we between here and there, you have a limited amount of fucks to give. Very few, in fact. And if you want to go around giving a fuck about everything and everyone but without conscious thought of, or choice, well, then you're going to be fu you're going to get fucked. <laughs> there is no subtle art to not giving a fuck. There is a there, sorry. There is a subtle art to not giving a fuck. And though the concept may sound ridiculous and I may sound like an asshole, what I'm talking about here is essentially learning how to focus and prioritize your thoughts effectively, how to pick and choose what matters to you and what does not matter to you based on finely honed personal values. This is incredibly difficult. This is incredibly difficult. It takes a long lifetime of practice and discipline to achieve, and you will regularly fail. But it. It is perhaps the most worthy struggle that one can undertake in one's life. It is perhaps the only struggle in one's life. Because when you give too many fucks, when you give a fuck about everyone and everything, you will feel that you're perpetually entitled to be comfortable and happy at all times. That everything is supposed to be just exactly the fucking way you want it to be. This is the sickness. It will eat you alive. You will see every adversity as an injustice, every challenge as a failure, every inconvenience as a personal slight. slight. Every disagreement as a betrayal, you will be conf confined to your own petty skull-sized hell, burning with entitlement and bluster, running circles around at your own very, very own personal fate feedback loop from hell in a constant motion, and arriving nowhere.